The Washington Monument is the defining feature of the Washington, D.C. skyline and the centerpiece of the nation's most symbolic public open space. But at ground level, this vast expanse remains unfinished and underutilized. For more than 200 years, citizens and design professionals have been proposing ideas for the monument and its surrounding grounds, but none was ever realized. In 2004, construction of security walls and accessible walkways added a completely new design element to the open grassy mound. Now, three separate new projects are being planned. The Army Corps of Engineers levy at 17th Street will protect downtown Washington from Potomac River flooding. The Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture will occupy the plot between 14th and 15th Streets along Constitution Avenue. And the National Park Service proposes as part of its new National Mall plan to rebuild the rundown Sylvan Theater south of the monument with new performance space and a visitor center. No one, though, is looking at the bigger picture of the Washington Monument grounds as a unified whole, as a fitting landscape setting for the Great Obelisk, a lively stage for recreation, First Amendment activities, and civic celebrations, including presidential inaugurations, or its place in the uniquely American story told on the National Mall. The purpose of the National Ideas Competition for the Washington Monument Grounds is to encourage Americans of all ages to develop innovative and creative ideas for making the Washington Monument Grounds more welcoming, educational, and effectively used by the public. Currently, there is no agreement as to what role the Monument Grounds could or should play in the future. Where did the idea for the Washington Monument come from? Why was that idea and all other ideas proposed over the past 200 years never carried out? Historically, the plans for Washington, D.C. gave pride of place to a monument to the father of our country. The story begins with the founding of the Capitol by President Washington himself, who in 1791 commissioned Peter L'Enfant to create a plan for the new city, a plan Washington proudly unfurls in this painting. In his plan, L'Enfant located the Capitol on a prominent hill at the center of the city, the White House on another rise a mile away, and an equestrian monument to George Washington where a line west from the Capitol intersected a line south from the White House, along the banks of the Potomac River and at the western terminus of a broad green public promenade we know today as the National Mall. The idea for an equestrian statue actually originated earlier. Already in 1783, the Confederation Congress had passed a resolution calling for an equestrian statue to be located at the seat of government to honor George Washington's military leadership during the War for American Independence, but that idea languished for over 40 years. In 1833, a group of local Washingtonians, dismayed at Congress's failure to build the monument, formed the Washington National Monument Society and offered certificates to anyone who contributed one dollar towards construction. The Society sponsored a design competition, but when none of the entries was considered suitable, Members selected a design by one of their own, architect Robert Mills. Mills envisioned an Egyptian-style obelisk surrounded by a colonnaded pantheon 100 feet high, topped by a statue of Washington in a horse-drawn chariot. Inside the colonnade, Mills envisioned statues of 30 prominent Revolutionary War heroes. Construction was begun in 1848, halted for 25 years, and only completed in 1884. The monument was constructed southeast of L'Enfant's site, due to poor soil conditions so close to the Potomac River shoreline. That intended location, shown in this 1850 sketch, was marked by a stone block known as the Jefferson Stone or Jefferson Pier, so called because Thomas Jefferson had wanted this powerfully symbolic spot at the heart of the Capitol to mark prime meridian for the United States. Already in the 1850s, Mill's elaborate design was undergoing change. Critics and members of Congress derided the obelisk as an unshapely mass. Mark Twain, in 1867, ridiculed the unfinished monument as a factory chimney with a top broke off, cow sheds about its base, a stump in a stockyard. Alternative designs were proposed, almost all of them revivals of historic forms. In addition, questions were raised about the stability of the partially completed obelisk and whether Mill's Bluestone Foundation would be able to support the full weight of the finished obelisk. In the end, construction was completed in 1884 under Colonel Thomas Casey of the Army Corps of Engineers. Casey underpinned the monument's foundation with a new concrete slab and buttress, 
drastically simplifying Mill's design and outmaneuvering those calling for a different concept, Casey envisioned the monument to be a plain obelisk, a technical marvel. This was to be the world's tallest solid masonry structure with the highest passenger elevator, lit within by electric lights, a triumph of modern science. In its simple abstract form, Casey's monument represented what critic Henry Van Brunt called for at a time when the United States, reunified following the Civil War, was becoming an international power on the world stage. It would be a modern symbol of national unity and greatness. Many ideas also were proposed for the triangle of land surrounding the Washington Monument, bounded to the west by the Potomac River and to the north by the mouth of Tiber Creek. Ideas included Benjamin Latrobe's concept to locate here a national university and a design by landscape architect Andrew Jackson Downing for a picturesque garden with curvilinear paths and natural groups of trees. By the end of the 19th century, the mall was a far cry from any of these ideas. Instead, it was a jumble of buildings, trees, and meandering paths. Railroad tracks crossed at the foot of the Capitol. Tiber Creek was buried under B Street, now Constitution Avenue, and the Washington Monument stood amid a sprinkling of trees and three fish ponds. Local Washingtonians, as well as architects nationwide, embarrassed by the conditions, called for a new plan. Some Washington community leaders tried, but failed, to win the 1892 World's Fair for the Federal City by proposing temporary and permanent exposition space around the monument. Glenn Brown, a founding member of the Washington chapter of the American Institute of Architects and secretary of the National AIA, proposed a plan for development of the National Mall with the Washington Monument at its center, surrounded by a colonnade and plaza. Brown and other members of the American Institute of Architects, who held their annual meeting in 1900 in Washington, D.C., influenced the next major planning effort for the Mall and Washington Monument grounds. In 1901, Congress created the Senate Park Commission to restore L'Enfant's vision and plan for the future. This commission, also known as the Macmillan Commission, included architect Daniel Burnham, who had worked on the 1893 Chicago World's Columbian Exposition, and landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr. The commissioners studied the 1791 L'Enfant plan and visited the grand gardens of Europe, such as Versailles, that might have inspired L'Enfant's plan. They created a grand new vision for the mall that more than doubled its size by expanding onto landfill dredged in the 1880s and 90s from the Potomac River by the Army Corps of Engineers. This new plan provided a site one mile west of the Washington Monument for the Lincoln Memorial and to the south a location for what became the Jefferson Memorial. The Lincoln Memorial added an important new chapter to the story told on the Mall of American government preserved in the Civil War. The Washington Monument grounds gained new prominence as the centerpiece of the mall's expanded geometry. The grounds were to be the gem of the mall system. The Washington Monument itself was the key challenge in the eyes of the designers. They wrote, no portion of the task set before the commission has required more study and extended consideration than has the solution of the problem of devising an appropriate setting for the monument. Taken by itself, the Washington Monument stands not only as one of the most stupendous works of man, but also is one of the most beautiful of human creations. Indeed, it is at once so great and so simple that it seems to be almost a work of nature. The Macmillan plan proposed an elaborate European-style formal garden filled with reflecting pools, fountains and sculpture, and ordered plantings of trees approached down a grand staircase. A round pool would mark L'Enfant's intended location for the monument. But this grand vision was doomed. In the 1930s, new concerns about the stability of the monument and worries that cutting into the soil could undermine the foundation caused Congress to abandon the Macmillan concept. So while much of the National Mall developed throughout the 20th century along the lines intended by the Macmillan Commission, the monument grounds at its center remained unfinished. The grounds instead were put to various uses. For 25 years, there was a swimming pool northwest of the monument. On the southeast corner, the Sylvan Theater was the setting for civic events and theatrical and musical performances. The original open-air stage was replaced in the 1940s with a wooden structure. From World War II until the 1960s, temporary government buildings occupied the entire west portion of the National Mall, including a large section of the Washington Monument grounds. Baseball diamonds nearby were popular with government workers. After the temporary buildings were removed, the National Park Service developed a new mall master plan that proposed burying the mall roads in tunnels, tripling the number of trees including on the monument grounds, and adding an elevated viewing terrace at 14th Street, another idea 
never realized. The 2001 security design for the grounds also proposed an informal planting of trees around the perimeter of the grounds, though this has not been carried out. A dramatically different idea was proposed in 1985 by architect Leon Creer, who envisioned a narrow Grand Canal down the spine of the mall, and in place of the monument grounds a much enlarged tidal basin linking the Washington Monument, Lincoln Memorial, and Jefferson Memorial. Today, however, the Washington Monument grounds show little evidence of any of the numerous ideas proposed over two centuries by Washingtonians, government agencies, and professional designers. The symbolic location intended for the monument, and Jefferson's choice for prime meridian, is all but forgotten. A small granite marker blocked off behind the new security walls. Current planning is project-based, but not concerned with the larger picture of the monument's role as a centerpiece of the National Mall. The new 17th Street levee will respond to a long history of flooding in this area and to new regulations for flood control management for the 100-year floodplain, shown here in gray, to encompass large portions of the Western Mall and Monument grounds. The new Museum of African American History and Culture will draw unprecedented visitors to this portion of the mall. So too could a renovated Sylvan Theater. How could the grounds of the future take advantage of these new attractions and visitors? The Olin Studio has brought an unprecedented elegance to security design, yet visitor screening still takes place in a makeshift temporary structure. The visitor to the Washington Monument grounds today gains little understanding of the monument's role as the centerpiece of the National Mall, or of the role of George Washington and other chapters of our country's history in this uniquely American symbolic landscape. Instead of lush shade trees and lively water elements, visitors encounter an unformed expanse. In many ways, the monument grounds are a blank slate. The unfinished condition is an opportunity to imagine a future that both responds to modern needs and anticipates the ground's evolving role in American democracy. How can this landscape continue to tell our American story into the future? How would you shape history with creative ideas? Join the conversation by entering the National Ideas Competition for the Washington Monument Grounds, open to anyone 12 years and older. Register by October 31, 2010. Submit your ideas by December 18, 2010. Learn more at whamocompetition.org.